Hey Research Stat 1, this is Stephanie coming to you with our video lecture for April 3rd, um, Friday, April 3rd, and um, just a couple quick notes. If you um, need to, to um, any kind of clarification about anything, please email me. Um, I haven't heard from very many of you. Um, I know I've had... Um, phone conf conferences with a couple of you this week that's a good thing um so if you're if you're worried about the class if you're needing something you know explained better um if you reach out to me i can i can know that and i can help you so please um keep that in mind um a couple of other things i'm getting a little concerned i'm noticing that some people are not watching the videos um and it could be that you feel like you're getting everything you need from the book, um, but typically that's not the case, and, and I haven't had anyone say that to me yet this semester when it was a face-to-face -face class, so it makes me think that probably isn't the case for it as an online class, so if you are um, struggling at all, um, you know, please make sure you're watching the videos, read the book, and then reach out to me. Um, I know a couple of you are putting off the videos, um, like until the weekend, you're competing for limited resources in your household right now, I get that, um, but I do just want to say, uh, you know, something that I think would be really beneficial to quite a few of you is to, you know, continue to come to class as if it was class. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday at nine o'clock, that was our class time, and, you know, set aside that hour to do your class, to, to watch the videos, um, to look at the, the um, lecture slides. Um, I think having that kind of a, um, like a regimented schedule, keeping that schedule, I think might be really beneficial. You feel like you're at university doing the university things that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and I think for a lot of us, you know, the days are kind of starting to get blurred together, right? And so um, creating that regimented schedule is actually kind of important, especially we're in, when we're in a situation like this. So, um, if you're struggling with that, um, you know, try to try to build up some accountability. Tell your family, hey, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I've got this course I have to 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 be a part of, and um, it's really important that I do that. And um, have them help you uh, um, if that's you know if that's an option. If not, you know, stick it in your um, phone so that you have an alarm going off, you know, five minutes before. Um, but it it is important, I think, for most people that they have some sort of schedule when they're in the midst of kind of all this crazy and so um, having school actually having classes to attend might actually help you um, create that kind of a an opportunity for yourself so um, think about doing something like that um, we are right on track um, for our exam on um, not this coming Monday right but the Monday after that I think that's April 13th um, the um, this um, class period, this um, today, Friday, we're going to be going over um, hypothesis testing. That means that on Monday we'll do the um, chapter six slides that um, it says chapter six, putting it all together. Um, and then we'll do the chapter seven slides on Wednesday and on Friday. So we are um, doing a good job. We've kind of had to squish some things together, but we're not behind. Okay. Um, so I know someone had asked me that when they called, they were like, gosh, that's a lot next week. But if you look at chapter seven, it's tiny. Um, in terms of the text, it's like less than 10 pages. Um, and so it's just, it's a calculation. It's an idea. Um, and so the calculation will take us a little bit of time to, to work on. And then we'll, um, it, it actually, it, it's a really quick lecture. So um, we're right on time um, for that, for that exam. Maybe you're not happy about that, but I am happy about that. All right. All right, so um, we are going to finish this um, introduction to hypothesis testing today. And when we stopped last class was talking about sal kind and um, the, the um, kind of things that make a theory a good theory. So what we have to think about today, I'm sorry, I said theory, but I meant hypothesis, things that make a hypothesis a good hypothesis. So what we have to think about today is constructing that hypothesis so that it is a good hypothesis, so that it's a good statement, right? A short, sweet, simple statement um, of what we expect to find in our research. So as we start to think about what we expect to find in our research, one of the things that we might think about is um, in, a, in a hypothesis, right? You're always comparing something to something else. And so when we actually write up the null hypothesis, the book tells us to put it in terms of the population. And there's a reason for this, that um, different 
books explain this different ways and, and some just say, just do it. <laughs> um, but the reality is this, right? If science is trying to uncover the truth, right? And the truth is kind of in the population, then we, and, and the hypothesis we're actually testing, right? Is the null hypothesis. If all of that is true, then um, the null hypothesis should be framed in terms of the population. That said, if you mess this up on a test and you put x bar 1 equals x bar 2 for the null hypothesis, let me tell you, I'm just going to be happy that you knew it was a mean of some kind. I'll write you a note um, correcting that, but um, I, I won't take off points. That said, it makes me really happy when you guys get it right. So um, when we're talking about the null hypothesis, we're going to write the HO, right? The null hypothesis. And then we put a colon there. Um, and then we say mu1 equals mu2. Um, as you start to do this more and more, you can replace one with the actual um, condition. So for example, if I had a um, new way to study for exams that I wanted to test, I might say um, the mu of Stephanie's new testing condition equals the mu of the old, or, I'm sorry, Let's go back. So I might say the mu of Stephanie's new study condition equals the mu of the old old beta study, right? And so I'm comparing those two things. So once you actually have independent variables that you can plug in and levels of an independent variable that you can plug in, you can do that. Instead of putting one, you can actually label it with the independent variable condition that you're interested in. So the null hypothesis isn't hard to, to write. It's whatever you're testing equals whatever other thing you're testing. And if you had multiple conditions, they, it would be all equal, right? So you could have mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3 equals mu4. The idea here is that there's no difference between your conditions. But the alternative hypothesis is where you're going to say, I expect to find differences between my conditions. And if you think about that, there's a couple of ways that you might expect a difference. So let's say that we're way back, you know, in the 1950s before anyone had really studied the best way to study for a test. Okay. So I may not have an idea of the best way to study for a test. I don't know a whole lot about cognition, right? The cognitive revolution starts in the 1950s. So I may not have a, a really good idea of different ways to study. And maybe I'm just going to test two different ways to study and see what happens, right? In that case, then, I do not have like a contender for, for the best. So I might write my, hypo my alternative hypothesis as x bar 1 equals not x bar 2. What I'm saying when I do that is that I know, so think about this, the alternative hypothesis is written at the level of your study, so sample. So do you see how we went from the mu for the null to the sample being an x bar? And that's because x bar is the mean of your sample, right? And so in my, in my experiment here, I'm going to pretend like I have two conditions, um, Stephanie's new awesome um, way to study and then the old way to study. But I don't know which one is better. I, I, I have no theory sort of guiding that yet. And so I'm just going to say that they're not going to be that the, the means of the two groups are not going to be equal. But I'm not going to guess about which one might be better or not better. I'm just looking for any difference. OK, so that's one way to write it. And that's called a non-directional hypothesis when you just have the not equals to. But I might write today. So 60 years later, 70 years later. Wow, we're in 2020 people, 70 years later. Um, I might have a different way to, um, to estimate which way of studying might be better. So I told you guys when I was in the Cog Psych Lab at UTSA, we were looking at um, people studying the differences, right? And we found that that was a really powerful way for people to, to, to do better, especially on multiple choice tests. That's what we were looking at. Um, and so um, we, we talked about this in class, right? We talked about the seductive lure, right? That, that um, second answer that's trying to make you choose it. And you really have to know the differences between the two options to choose the right option. So if that's the case, if that's what, um, what I, you know, I have a lot of information now, right? I have 70 years of information about how the brain processes information, um, best ways to study. What I might 
do then is say, you know what, I really want to test this idea of studying differences. Um, and I want to see how that impacts um, students. I know that what should happen on a multiple choice test is that they should perform better if they study the differences than if they just study in a traditional method like repetition. In that case, then I'm not going to just say X bar one equals not X bar two because I have a theory behind me that is really driving this idea. And I actually don't care if they do worse. I still um, want to reject the null hypo I'm sorry. I still want to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So what I what I want to do for um, a directional hypothesis is I want to say this group will do better than this other group. Or you could, of course, rephrase that, right? This group will do worse than this other group. And the way we do that is by using greater than or less than signs, okay? So if I think that group one will do better than group two, then I'm going to say group one will score greater than group two, right? If I think that group one will do worse than group two, then I'm gonna say group one will do less than group two, right? Because we're talking about the mean. So now think about it with the X bar, okay? So X bar one will be greater than X bar two. If I expect that X bar one, so the first group will do better, right? We'll have a higher score. So when we start to think about this greater than or less than thing, I want you guys to notice a couple of things. So the biggest mistake that students make on this is that they put greater than or equal to, right? They use that little symbol, the greater than symbol, and then they have the the line underneath it or equal to, but you guys equal to is in the null hypothesis, right? So the null hypothesis is already testing that they're equal. So when we talk about greater than and less than, it's, it's a true greater than, it's a true less than, there's none of that equals to stuff happening. And so you can see that in the book, you can see that in the slides as well. The other thing that we have to talk about here is that equal to and, and greater than, excuse me, I don't know how to use the editing software, so you're just getting this live and um, however it is. Um, so the the idea of equals to here is different than equals to in the real world. Okay, so in the real world, does five equal five? The answer to that is, of course, it does Stephanie, you're crazy, right? Okay, in the real world, though, does 5.0 equal 5.2? And the answer to that is, of course not, you crazy woman, right? <laughs> um, 5.0 is a different number than 5.2. They occupy different spaces on a number line, right? But the question that we ask in hypothesis testing, when we use the idea of equal to, when we use the idea of greater than, when we use the idea of less than, when we use the idea of not equal to, it's a little bit different than just using a number line. Okay, and so um, there are a couple of things to think about here. It is true in the real world that 5.0 does not equal 5.2, but we're asking statistically speaking, does 5.0 equals 5.2? And when we run those tests that we're going to run, it's actually going to give us a probability. If we are using um, SPSS, it's actually going to spit out what we call p-value. And it's going to tell us the probability that in this case, a 5.0 is close enough to a 5.2 that they're not actually significantly different from each other. And we're going to talk a lot about this when we get into the correlation component of the class, the last unit, unit four. Um, so... When we talk about equals to or, or not equals to or greater than or less than, we are not talking about those things as if they were on a number line. We are not talking about them in terms of statistical significance. And that is a little bit of a different beast. And like I said, right now we're doing some seed planting. We're going to think about this a lot over the next couple of weeks. Okay. All right. So if we have our null hypothesis and that is what we are testing. So um, I've moved on to slide six in the um, introduction to hypothesis testing PowerPoints. So if it's true that we're going to test the null hypothesis, then we are going to do something fancy called null hypothesis significance testing. And in uh, null hypothesis significance testing, you have two possible outcomes. And these for many students are totally contrary to the way they're 
brain wants to work. So you're really going to have to study this and think about it and learn it um, because your brain might want to think about this in a totally different way. So the first way that you can, um, the first thing that might happen is that you reject the null hypothesis. So our null hypothesis, remember, is the idea that the means of our two groups are the same. So if you find a difference between your two groups, then you would reject the null hypothesis. Okay, but again, it's not just did you find a difference, right? Again, if you have 5.0 versus 5 point, so group one has a mean of 5.0, O, and group two has a mean of 5.2, the question is not just are those different numbers, right? The question is, are they different enough from each other? So again, we're not just doing raw numbers on a number line, right? And we're going to think more about that um, in the coming, like I said, in the coming weeks. But if statistically speaking, those numbers are different enough from each other, then you are going to reject the null hypothesis. You found a difference between your groups. So for my um, for my um, first example, right, with Stephanie's awesome new um, way to study versus um, the regular way to study, if my null hypothesis, I'm sorry, if my alternative hypothesis was just x bar one equals not x bar two, and I found a difference where my new test made students do significantly better, I would reject the null hypothesis. But also, if my new way of studying made students do even worse, I would still reject the null hypothesis. Remember that my hypothesis was not directional, right? If I had a non-directional, it was just equals not, then either way, either direction that the hypothesis went, I would reject that null hypothesis. But, if I had a directional hypothesis, so I said, you know what, I think my test is going to make students score better, or I'm sorry, my way of studying is going to make students score better on the test. Now I have a unique situation. If I run my test and I find that students did do significantly better when they used my study method, then I would reject the null hypothesis. That's what I had expected to find. But if if my new way of studying made students do worse on the test, then I would fail to reject the null hypothesis, okay? So let's talk about failing to reject the null hypothesis. In general, when you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you're, you're saying one of two things. Either you found no significant difference between the variables or, is, and that's kind of the way to think about it no matter what, but if you have a directional hypothesis, it could also be the case that there was a significant difference between your two variables, but it went the opposite way than you expected, okay? And so in both of those cases, you would um, fail to reject that null hypothesis, okay? So normally right now, there would be like a hundred questions. Um, and so I've tried to kind of answer those questions as, as we've gone through. Um, but if you are looking at this and you, first of all, if you have not read the book, hit pause, go read this section. It's not that long. Um, go read this section and um, see if you have any questions about it, okay, um, after you read it. So um, if you still have questions, please email me. Like I said, sometimes talking this through can help um, quite a bit, okay? So we pretend like you guys have asked all the questions that you needed to ask about that, okay? So now we're going to start thinking about an even bigger idea, and that is this. So we are going to always draw a conclusion. It's always based on our data, okay? And it's always based on the laws of probability. So in terms of the laws of probability, one of the things that we do is we use an alpha level or a probability level of 0 0.05. And we say that our results are statistically significant if our probability of making an incorrect decision um, reaches a, is, is at a certain level. And for us, like I said, that's always going to be 0 0.05. So um, 
on our tables, on our statistical tables that are in the back of the book, um, you're always going to be, be using the 0 0.05 probability, okay? Um, when we use um, SPSS and when we use Excel to do this, it's at the, those um, computer programs actually calculate the probability for us, and so um, it will actually tell us the exact probability that the conclusion that we draw is either, um, well, it, it's going to basically tell us the um, probability that the conclusion that we draw is due to chance. And we are only going to draw a statistical conclusion where we reject the null hypothesis if that probability is less than 0 0.05. So again, there's that less than, right? If the probability that you get in SPSS is 0 0.05, you will fail to reject your null hypothesis it has to be less than 0 0.05, okay? If it's less than 0 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis. So if we reject the null hypothesis, there's still a chance that the conclusion we're drawing is wrong. And if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, there is still a chance that the conclusion we're drawing is wrong. And so we set that chance at 5%. In other words, another way to think about this, right, is that we are saying 5% of the time when we draw a conclusion from our data, we're drawing the wrong conclusion. So if we fail to reject the null, we actually should have rejected it. If we reject the null, we actually should have retained it. <coughs> retained it or failed to reject it, then that means the same thing. So this for many students is kind of a mind boggling idea. I get it because we actually will never know if the conclusion we drew was right or whether the conclusion we drew was wrong. So we have this little chart and this chart is the seventh slide of your PowerPoint. And in this chart,